We are coming this morning from the book of John, chapter 3, if you'd like to turn with me. Today is Palm Sunday. It's a Sunday that uh, in the New Testament when Jesus made what's called the triumphal entry. Uh, you'll remember whenever he rode down into Jerusalem on the back of a uh, colt of an ass or a donkey. And uh, that signified something to the Jewish mind. It signified the fact that here the King of Kings was coming to offer himself in peace. Coming in peace. Now Jesus is going to come again. Okay? Uh, we're going to meet him Next, next prophetic thing on the outlook here, the rapture, we're going to meet him in the air. But that's not the second coming because he doesn't come to earth. He meets us in the air. He comes down and we're caught up to be with him. Uh, thus we get the word catch away or rapture, okay, that comes to us. But the second coming, whenever he comes then, it'll be at the end of the tribulational period. And uh, he's going to come astride the back of a white horse this time. And he's going to have a sword and, uh, protruding from his mouth, it says, okay? And it's the word of God. He's going to come as a king in war. And he's going to conquer all the evil of the world that's here at that point in time. He's going to snatch up the old devil. And he's going to cast him into the bottomless pit. Okay? And all these things will be done. But this triumphal entry was when Jesus came, and this had to be done, Jesus offered himself. And we have to remember why it was he came and offered himself at this time. Prior to his coming, just right before, in God's eyes, okay? In man's eyes, it was thousands of years ago. Man had sinned against God. And when he sinned against God, he broke fellowship, relationship with God. He died. Okay, and that's what death means, separation. So whenever he died, God made a promise. He said, one day I'm going to send the seed of the woman, and the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of Satan and sin. Okay? But... Satan's going to bruise his heel in the process. So the first prophetic uh, prophecy of Jesus to come is there in Genesis chapter 3. But whenever Jesus came into the world, babe in a manger, grew to manhood, started his public ministry, which went on three plus years, okay, and demonstrated, talked about himself, now it's to the point that says, I am here. The Messiah has come. And he offers himself. You know what would have happened if the world would have accepted him as king at that point? We would have had to went through all the misery that's been going on for thousands and thousands of years here. But God knew that they weren't. It was within his... Uh, divine providence because something hadn't been dealt with had the you know the world accepted him God would have had to come up with a different process to take care of the sin of the world okay and Satan they had to be dealt with so even as Jesus came in he knew that they were not going to accept him and he knew what lay ahead of him in the week to come. And how that at the end of that week, he would be hanging on a cross between heaven and hell. All his disciples forsook him, gone away, one even cursing, all alone on a cross. And then for a moment in time, God the Father and God the Holy Spirit didn't forsake, but they turned their attention, they turned their faces away from Jesus on the cross. And the whole of creation turned black. 
got so dark you couldn't see your hand if you put it up in front of your face. God's glory, the light of God that we've been studying about, was taken away from the world. And Jesus cried out, My God, My God, why have you forsaken me? Folks, Jesus on that cross of Calvary, and I just repeated here, we define what hell is. You know, we think about hell and we talk about the fire and the brimstone and the torture and the pain. And all that's going to be there because the Word of God tells us that. If we do not come to a point in our life where we see Jesus Christ and we believe upon who He is, His name, and we accept who He is and we accept the salvation that He made possible on the cross of Calvary, if we do not make that decision, we are going to be separated from God throughout all eternity to come. We will die. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to cease to exist. But if you've never accepted Jesus Christ, and let me make that point very clear here, it's a decision on your part. Jesus paid the price on the cross of Calvary. He was buried, he rose again, victorious over death in the grave. And as he rose, those who believe on his holy name and on his person and accept what he did on the cross of Calvary, they too shall live, they will rise. But those who don't are going to spend eternity separated from the holy God that loves you. And folks, nobody can do it for you. If they could, all the parents and the grandparents that love Jesus Christ in the world would be so happy if we could do it for our children and our offspring and our neighbors, but we can't. There has to come a time in your personal existence when God knocks upon your heart's door and invites you to come back to Him. And you, understanding the gospel, the good news of the word that Jesus died and paid the penalty for you. And all you have to do is accept it unto yourself. If you have not personally made that decision, you will not go to heaven. You will be cast into the everlasting lake of fire where there's weeping and there's wailing and there's a gnashing of teeth. And where your soul says you were, but where your soul died not. And worst of all, God chooses not to have his presence there. You see, he chose that on the cross of Calvary because that is the true penalty that Jesus paid for you and me. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three distinct personalities, one being. And God the Father and God the Holy Spirit for that three hours, it's a moment in time, but for that three hours, turn their faces away from Jesus Christ. And he felt the loneliness of not being a part of the Trinity. He was still a part. He couldn't take himself out of it, but he felt that loneliness for you. Important, okay? It's important. Well, I think I did that, preacher. I, I, I'm pretty sure I did. I think I did. No, if you did it, you know it. Okay? I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I was in the church service, evening service, sitting back here three pews back on the, uh, my right-hand side. And whenever the invitation was given, the word was preached, I understood it. When the invitation was given, God knocked upon my heart's door. I felt him within my being calling me and offering me salvation, union, back with him again, back in fellowship with him. And I had a decision to make when I was sitting in that pew, okay? And
and I worked my way out and I walked down to the front and I knelt at the little rail we had in the front. We called it the kneeling altar. And there I surrendered my heart to Jesus Christ. And I accepted what he had to give me. I remember that. I know that. You can't slip into heaven. There's no other way. Jesus talked about it like a sheepfold. You know, a corral, basically. And it had one way to come in and out. And the shepherd would always lay and sleep there in, in the entrance so that the wolves couldn't get in and the sheep wouldn't go out without him knowing it. And he said, anybody that climbs over the wall, you know, no, they're not saved. You can't do that. You've got to come in by the gate. And you've got to come through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Now I say that to our congregation here, and you may be sitting there saying, Preacher, I've done that. I'm okay, I'm right, I'm ready to go. So move on, we know this, preach something else. Well, I've got a video camera going back there, and this is going to be on YouTube. And this is going to be on Facebook, maybe. You know, so I'm talking to all the people that might be hearing this out in the world. You must make a decision to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you do not, you will die and go to a godless, Christless hell throughout all eternity. So please, please make that decision. You know, that ties in because we're in John chapter what? Three. three. What happens in John chapter three? Nicodemus. Nicodemus and Jesus talking about the way, the truth, and the light, and uh, how it is that Jesus is going to die and give himself for a cruel, cruel cross. Uh, we talked about Nicodemus a little bit last week in the fact that uh, he was a part of a uh, religious group which was named the... Pharisees, okay. So he was a believer in God, okay. He, he accepted, he believed in Him. But uh, he had a certain way of looking at life. And uh, I'm not going to rehearse all that we talked about last week, but uh, we tried to look at it from his perspective. Now he came by night talking to Jesus and asking Him about. Uh, you know, uh, the way of the world and the way of life and explain to me uh, your thoughts on the law of Moses. You know, what should be done, what should be done. I'm paraphrasing this, okay? And we went down that Jesus had talked to him and whenever Nicodemus said, we know that you're a good teacher. You're a master. You come from God. You know, you've done miracles. We believe that God sent you. You know, and then Jesus interrupted him and said, "Except a man be born again. born again, he cannot see or know anything about the kingdom of God. You can't have the knowledge and the understanding unless first you're born back into fellowship with God." That's what I was just talking about. We must make a decision to accept Christ as his Savior. And then we went down through uh, Jesus talking to Nicodemus, and Nicodemus couldn't understand what he was talking about being born again. And Jesus said, uh, that which is born of the flesh is what? Flesh. flesh. But that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. Okay? And then he went into talking about something, and I kind of wound up with this. I didn't have time to get into it last week too much. But he talked to, uh, Jesus did, he talked to Nicodemus about a, a happening, a time, a circumstance that Nicodemus would have been very much familiar with, okay? And that's whenever Jesus, or God, Father, was uh, punishing, we'll, we'll use that, correcting the children of Israel because they were not being faithful to him. And he sent serpents or adders into the camp in the wilderness journey whenever they were journeying for 40 years out there in the wilderness. 
And they were biting people and they were getting deathly sick and some were even dying, okay? And so Moses, he did what he did so well during the wilderness journeys. He fell on his face before God and he interceded for the children of Israel and said, God, send us salvation. So God said, okay, Moses, what I'm going to do for you, you take a, a pole and you set it up in the middle of the camp and you, you take brass or bronze and you fashion a serpent, okay? And you put it up on that pole. You know that serpent's still around in, uh, uh, in the medical field and identified with what is the symbol or the logos that they use? It's, I think it's two serpents twined about a pole, okay? But this is where they got that. That's where they picked it up. But God said, you take that brazen serpent and you put it up on that pole and you set it right in the middle of the camp, okay? Now let me back up here a little bit and explain something to you. Whenever they camped, they didn't camp the way we do. You know, if you're a camper, you know, you go into an RV park or a campground or whatever, and you have roads going this way and that way, and loops go here and there. You pick where you want to be. Well, when the Israel encamped, they set up the camp of Israel, which again was, you know, 750 to a million people, 750,000 to a million people. They set it up the way God said set it up. In the center was the tabernacle. Now the tabernacle was what? It was the temple, the place of worship, the place of meeting. It's the place where they came to do their sacrifices and to meet with God and, and to be obedient to God. That was right in the center of the camp. And then the, how many tribes of Israel were there? Twelve. Twelve tribes of Israel. They would set up, and I forget the directions they were in. I'd have to go back and look it up in the Bible. But one was camped to the north, and another was camped to the uh, northwest, and another was camped to the west, all encircled about the tabernacle, okay? So if he was to take the uh, raisin serpent on that pole and set it up in the center of the camp, he would have set it somewhere near the tabernacle so that anybody around that was camping around there, they had the tent set up, they could see that serpent, okay? And then God told Moses, he said, if anyone is bitten by these adders, these serpents that I've sent, and they will look to that serpent on that pole, that brazen serpent, and believe. Okay, they had to believe. And they will believe then they will not die. Okay? Now that's where this verse came, came from here in verse 14, chapter 3. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up on the cross of Calvary. Jesus was lifted up. Now notice that the Israelites had to believe that God would heal them. They had to believe that God is who he says he is. He will do what he says he will do. And he can do what he says he will do. Okay? They had to believe that when they looked at that serpent. Now as Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, he says Jesus has to be lifted up that way. That whosoever believeth in him. Now, I've talked about this a whole lot, and uh, what I did this week is I wanted to go down and sort of give you where I get my understanding and belief a little bit. And what I do in that is I go back to the uh, original writings, the writings of antiquity, okay? Now, the book of John would have been written in what language? Greek. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew and some in Aramaic. The New Testament was written in Greek, okay? The one that we have. Now, the apostles didn't sit down so much and write it in the Greek. However, they were living in the Greek world at that time, okay? But it was 
written there so we'd have it. So we have to look at that. And I looked up that word believe or believe, okay? And I want you to catch what it says here. And in the Greek language, they have a lot of different, uh, whether it's feminine or uh, masculine or whether it might be uh, passive or, you know, you've got to take into those things. So it gives you several different understandings that the first century Christian would have had on this. To believe also means to entrust. Okay? Okay. To commit. Okay. If you go on down and you look at believe, well, let me just read it all to you. To commit, in the passive voice, it means to entrust with. Okay? They were entrusted with the oracles of God. I have entrusted, has been entrusted to me. And then it also says here in the Strong's, uh, Strong's is a concordance. What Strong's concordance will give you is they'll give you a number of the Greek word and it'll tell you what... Uh, uh, you, you want to understand passive or whatever. To believe, also to be persuaded of, and hence to place confidence in, to trust. It signifies in this sense of the word a reliance upon not a mere credence. It most, uh, it most frequently is seen in the writings of John, especially in the gospel. He does not use the noun. Now, the word believe here is not a noun, it's a verb, okay? So it's something we act upon, something that we do. So what John is saying here is that you believe in, you entrust. Let me read those uh, adjectives again here. To be persuaded of, to place confidence in, and to trust. To rely upon. So we're not just saying, okay, we believe that Jesus was a man and he lived in the world and his name is Jesus and we trust Jesus because that's his name. We are saying we understand who he is, what he stands for. We believe by our understanding of the word of God here that he is God incarnate, which means God with us, God in human flesh. I believe that. And I believe what the gospel says about him, that he died on that cross of Calvary. Okay? So this idea of belief isn't just, eh, Jesus was a man. He walked in the world. I see it in history books. Josephus writes about him. So yeah, I believe that he lived and I believe that he would. No, I believe in who he is, what he does, and how he loves me. And that's just the whole aspect of who he is. And we're going to see that again when we talk about the name of God. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Okay. I looked that one up too. I've got to come down here. They're not in order to what I've got them here. Uh, let me give you what vines. I uh, went to the uh, Strongs and Vines here. Pick it up. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will not perish. Perish means to destroy. The middle voice to perish is used of things. Perish can also mean to fall. Uh, perished also means that the perishing where the perfective force of the verb implies the completion of the process of destruction. Okay? To destroy. Destroy. In the middle voice denotes to perish together. To die. To perish. Now what does that word die mean? I didn't look that up again. Separate. Okay. 
to make unseen, to vanish away, to corrupt, decay, destruction, unto corruption. So whenever we see that if we believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, on the person of Christ, in who he is, what he is, and what he can do, we believe we will not perish. We will not be separated from. We will not be destroyed. Okay? So, yeah, we won't go to hell, right? But we'll also be separated from the sin of this world. Sin of this world. Shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, that word eternal is important here, okay? Eternal means it never stops. Now, unsaved people will have eternal existence. Where will, where will the unsaved exist? Hell. In hell. But will they have life? No, because life implies union with God. Okay? We will in heaven, but they won't hell. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but is condemned already. Name. The name of God. Like I said, I didn't put these in order here, so I had to find them. Okay, number one. In general, the name by which a person is called. That's easy enough, right? But that's not what we're believing in, okay? Uh, number two is what we want to take from this and what we understand that Jesus means by his believe on the name, okay? For all that a name, quote, implies of authority, of character, of rank, of majesty, power, excellence, etc., so, okay? Who is that person? Who is that being? All that he is, not just what he's called by or, or what uh, title we give him. Who is that person? And who is Jesus Christ? He is the eternal God. He is the one who created all that there is, who holds together all that he is. He is the one that makes it possible and has the provision of life and whatever you have or are, are able to use, the abilities you have, everything is summed up in the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the, uh, the Holy Spirit, okay? So in Jesus Christ, we believe in the name. Now, God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world. God didn't get mad and say, okay, I'm going to send Jesus Christ to condemn you. God will get you for that. Who used to say that? Is that Maud or somebody on TV? God will get you for that. You know. No, God won't get you for that. Our God, and we touched on a little bit in Sunday school this morning when we were talking about a just God and the just, just uh, uh, judgment of God, okay, that he is a just God. Well, the basis for God's judgment is God himself. And God cannot be untrue to himself. That's why when he sits upon the great white throne judgment, Jesus does, and he casts people into the lake of fire, we bring up, and rightfully so, that uh, God's not the one causing them to be there. He made it possible that they didn't have to be there. He died on the cross. But they're going there because they did not accept him. They're putting themselves in hell. But Jesus is the judge sitting at the great white throne judgment and he's judging them 
compared to the justness of holy God. Okay? And what is it that makes us right in the eyes of God? The shed blood of Jesus Christ. And that's the only thing that can do it. There's nothing that we can do to make us right in God's eyes. So Jesus is implementing true justice because he's laying it against the just person of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And if he did not judge justly, that would disqualify him from being God himself. Okay. So yeah, the justice is right, the justice is true. God didn't sin, God the Father didn't send Jesus in so that you would be condemned to hell. But as he goes on to say here, but that the world through him might be saved, he that believeth on him is not what? Condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. When were, when was mankind condemned to hell? In the Garden of Eden, at the tree, whenever Adam made the fruit, okay? And he sinned against God. There's the condemnation. Jesus came into the world that we might be saved from that condemnation. Because he had believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light, ooh, we talked about that several weeks back. What's the light that came into the world? The light of God, the understanding, the perception of God. Now the world that's already condemned, they don't have the light. They don't have the proper perception of the world and of God. They need to get that. And where do we get that? From the Word. Where did you get the perception of God? The when we were saved. That's what I was looking for. Okay? The Holy Spirit brought it into your life. Okay? I see the light. I see the light. Yeah, what light? The understanding, the perception that God gives us. This is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness, darkness rather than the light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. Men have a choice to make. Mankind. Men, women, girls, boys. We have a choice to make. Will we accept the perception of Jesus Christ, the light that he brings, and become born-again children of God and begin to grow, read his word, and live in the light and walk in the light? The scripture tells us about that. Or will we decide, no, I don't want the light. I, I, I kind of like the darkness. I, I like what I'm walking in here. And darkness is the evil. Okay? That mankind lives in. Okay. Another word I wanted you to see here was that word that we brought out. I just went by it here. Hate. Hateful. Hater. Hatred. Verse 20. For everyone that doeth evil... What? Hated. What does he hate? The light, the, light. the light, the perception of God. Again, we touched on that a little bit when we talked about opposition that we run into because we're Christians, okay? People do not like the light of Jesus Christ, the light of the Word, the light of God, because they like the darkness. They like to think what I feel in my sinful self is okay for me to do is right. Okay? And they call what's wrong right. That's why there's so much fighting over Roe versus Wade. You know? That's why whenever these politicians get up there and they want to be voted in, they appeal to the sin of man. 
you want to do this, it's okay. You're not hurting anybody, you know. Uh, you know, if, if you want to have an abortion, you know, as far as the Roe versus Wade goes on, uh, I mean, you know, that's just a blob of cells within your uh, womb. You don't have to worry about it. It's a viable way of, uh, of uh, child control, birth control. You know, that, that's sort of the way that people look at it. You know, if, if you want to partake in the uh, L, B, Q, B, C, D, A, F, whatever that thing is, with the homosexuals and so on. You know, it's okay. God, God loves you anyway. You know, God is love, isn't he? Isn't God love? <laughs> oh, it depends on whether you're seeing in, in the light of God or the darkness of the world. The darkness of the world says God's love, he won't send anybody to hell. You know, he loves you just as you are. He made you like you are, so he loves you that way. No. No, that's not the righteousness, the holiness, the just God that we serve. God says that this is right, it's right. If God says it's wrong or sin, it's wrong. Okay? And we can't change it by popular opinion. Okay, so they hated the light. What does that mean? Malicious, unjustifiable feelings towards others, whether towards the innocent or mutual animosity. Of a right feeling of aversion from what is evil. So it is okay to hate sometimes, but we hate what's evil. We hate what's contrary to God. Of relative preference for one thing over another. By way of expression, either aversion from or disregard for the claims of one person or thing relatively to those of another. In other words, you love one thing, you hate another. Okay? That's what it's talking about. Uh, the possibility of serving two masters in Luke 14, 26. You can't serve two masters. You'll either love the one and hate the other, or you'll hate the one and love the other. Okay. So love, perish, hate. The light of God. Where are we individually as we approach the perception of who God is? Now, John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Turn with me in closing here back over to 1 John, the book of 1 John, and look at chapter 3 again. I think we'll back up, maybe, maybe read from verse 1. I want to hone in on verses 16 through 18. Now, John here speaks a great deal about love, okay? It is the perspective that John was coming from. He was the disciple that Jesus loved. Uh, he chose to go back and begin his gospel, his telling of the life and person of Jesus Christ, back to the beginning. Okay, and he speaks about the love of God. Well, as we get into his smaller letters, the epistles, he, he's holding to that. He talks a great deal about love, and that's what we're going to see here. And it explains a little bit about the love that he understood was the agape love, the love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay, God loved us. He loved us in spite of ourselves, okay? Now, once we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, once we have passed from death unto life, we are born again, then John explains more here in verse, uh, 1 John how we are to live, okay? 
and he encompasses this idea of God's love. Chapter 3, 1 John. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. You see how he puts that? He didn't have, say he has towards us. He bestowed upon us. That we should be called the sons of God, and therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we, he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he, meaning Christ, is pure. So what's John saying? If we have the love of God in us, what are we going to be doing? Purifying ourselves. How do we do that? By the Word of God. We read, we understand through the Spirit, and whenever it tells us to take off this part of the old man and put on this part of the new, we do it. Whenever God gives us the understanding, you know, of, of how we should live, we are living more for Him. And folks, that's the way we prepare for eternity, okay? Uh, you're not going to take anything physical out of this world, okay? What you take out of this world is going to be emotional and spiritual. Who you are. You know, we talked about believing on the name. Well, if we take that aspect of a name, who are you? What do you believe? How do you act? How do you make your decisions? What uh, principles do you live your life by? Whoever committeth sin transgresseth the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. And you know he was manifest to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him. Oh, do you abide in Christ? I do. Do you, do you sin? Well, that's contrary to what it said here. We don't sin habitually. We don't continue in sin. 1 John 1, 9, then it gets to it a little later. If you will confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness, right? And then we do what Jesus told the woman that was caught in the act of adultery. After she believed upon him, he said, go and sin no more. We're, we're growing. We're, we're going there. So when you read this, don't say, uh, like my grandma did, okay, this is a verse she took me to when we had our discussion, that, you know, a Christian doesn't sin. Well, if you study the original text and the context of the verse here, it means we do not sin continually. We don't come into a sin and say, well, you know, this is contrary to God's will, but I, I kind of like it. I think I'm going to keep doing it. And don't you sit there and say that you don't do it, because we all do, okay? We have those pet things, whether it be uh, gossip or lying or, or thinking harshly of another person and feeling hard towards other people. There's some hard things if we're going to not sin in God's, eye, God's eyes that we have to deal with and we have to overcome, right? But that's what he's talking about. We don't just continue and habitually. It's just habit with us. We do it. Okay. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither knoweth him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as God, he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. You cannot continually commit the same sin over and over again without God getting you. God get you for that. 
He will get your conscience. He will make you feel terrible. He will, he will make you feel ashamed. Okay? That's part of the work of the Holy Spirit within you. He reproves you of sin. And what you have to do if you're a born-again child of God and you expect to live a, a victorious life in Christ, you have to deal with that sin when the Holy Spirit brings it before you. And, and you've got to put it away and as Jesus said, go and sin no more. Verse 10. In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Now we're talking about love, you remember. We got off track there a little bit. We're talking about God's love. The God they love of God, for God so loved the world. So John said that he that loveth not his brother. Uh, let me back up on that. Whosoever doth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that ye have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, okay? Not as Cain, who was that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Because of his own works were evil, and his brothers were righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in, what does the word death mean? Separation. Separation. If you don't love your brother, you're separated from God in some way, shape, or form. God cannot open up the windows of heaven and pour out his blessing upon you the way he wants to if you do not love your Who is my brother? Everybody. Okay, everybody, and more in particular, other Christians, okay? Do you know other Christians that you would just as soon not be around? Yes. Okay, do you love them? Oh, yeah. don't answer that. <laughs> That, that's, where, that's where we're going. That's what we're getting at. Verse 15. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Whereby perceive, whoa, whoa. Hereby perceive, what is that word perceive? What does that uh, tie into? What was that word we talked about in uh, early in John when the light is what? Perception. Perception. Perceive. Perception. So what is your perception? Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for who? For the brethren. Okay? For those we call our brothers. What does it mean to lay down our life for them? I use it a whole lot when I'm talking about marriage, okay? Uh, God tells in the book of Ephesians, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And I remind husbands that that's our role in the marriage is to lay our lives down. Well, sure, I'll jump in front of a bullet every day to save my wife, right? Well, will you give up the ball game? Will you give up uh, honey? You know, will you give up whatever it is that's dear to you for your wife? Will you give up a personality trait because it offends or brings a harsh shadow upon your wife? You see what I'm saying here? We need to lay down our lives for our brother. Now, I, I put it to the wife and in the marriage situation there. But what about in Christendom, in the church, the universal and the local church? Will we give up who we are for the benefit of our brothers and sisters in Christ? Boy, that's good food for thought. That, that's turnip greens and spinach right there, okay? Verse 17, 
But whoso hath this world's goods, and seeth his brother hath need, and shut up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? So one of the very basic ways that we can love God, that we know that we love God, is do somebody need something I have? You know, why do I have it? What is the purpose of me owning an automobile, of owning a home, of, of having plenty of food in the larder, you know? What's the benefit of all this? Well, that's to keep me in mind, you know. Right? But what if we see others that have need? Are we giving to them? Are we giving up who we are, what we like, our selfishness, so that we can reach a world of Christ? God has given you and me, myself, I, a great, great, great opportunity. We are living in the end of the end time. You can believe that, folks. We are living in them. The whole world is falling apart and going to destruction around us. And God has put us here to do just what we were talking about this morning. Just what Jesus did. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Okay? God has given the world around you. You. Now. Will you show that world the love of God? Father, we give you praise and glory and honor. We thank you, Father, for who you are and what you've done for us. Thank you for the word and help us to be faithful. Lord, we know ourselves. We know we're sinful creatures. We know that we fail you time and time again. And we are far, far from being what we call perfect. But Lord, it's my prayer that you will keep us so close to you in the walk in the spirit that we might hear your reproof, that we might confess our sin, that we might turn it over to you and we might be pictures of you to the world around us. And then we might follow through with that, Lord, that we might love uh, the world as you love it and to offer you and to see people love you. Lead God